morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Welch with the Texas Asphalt Pavement Association. I have Chuck Fuller here. Good also, morning. we're going to get started on our webinar. Today's webinar will be best practices for compaction and rolling patterns. Uh, we will take questions at the end of our webinar, so if you'll uh, write something down and we'll ask questions, we'll unmute everyone and uh, we'll have that done. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, this is put on by the Texas Asphalt Pavement Association, and we appreciate every, everybody that's called in today. All right, best practice for compaction is what we'll start about. We'll start on first. You can see the picture there. There's a lot of action going on. So let's talk about this. Our compaction goals are density, smoothness, and high stability to allow us to use these pavements for the traveling public. We have to do them correctly, and we want long-lasting pavements that are durable. So this compaction is one of our key elements in getting this durability. Why compaction? Improve mechanical stability, improve resistance to rutting, and reduce moisture penetration. Also, we improve the resistance to cracking, so proper compaction is very important. It's, it's good to note here that why do we, why do we want compaction? Um, there's uh, been studies done that 1% increase in air voids results in a minimum of 10% reduction in pavement life. So what we're trying to do is manipulate the asphalt to be able to get the optimum density, you know, for the different types of mixes out there. But if you put that in perspective, for every percent air void that we uh, that we remove, we increase our our uh, pavement life by 10%. So that's the reason that compaction is so important. It's a good point. Uh, compaction forces, we have pressure, which is a downward force. Impact would be like a hammer blow. The vibration was a rapid series of impact blows. And manipulation would be the kneading in a confined manner. And we're gonna talk about each one of those. Four phases of compaction in our uh, compaction train would be the screed. Uh, Chuck, we get anywhere from 85 to 90 percent right. of compaction as it comes under the screed. Uh, I hear of some new rollers, I mean new uh, pavers and uh, screeds that are getting up to 91, 92 percent. We have the breakdown roller, which is our number two part. Usually that's a steel wheel roller. Uh, they operate in vibratory mode to assist in the compaction. Uh, the third part would be intermediate roller could be a pneumatic tire roller or a vibratory steel roller, and it could also be operated in static mode also. Uh, sometimes they'll have a finished roller, because it's a small steel wheel roller in static. And uh, just to finish up, some of the uh, marks maybe that might be in the surface of the mix. But that's our four phases of compaction. Hang on one second. Apparently we have an, an issue, Larry, with uh with our viewing. We cannot see the presentation. Tell them to hang on one second. All right, pardon us just a minute. We had a caller wrote in on our screen. If someone else could type in whether they can see it or not. Can't see anything. Okay, we appreciate that. Apparently we're having a issue. We have not done a webinar since the hurricanes came through, so it could be something we're having trouble with. Now, could somebody type and tell me if they see it? Okay, let's go back into the front. And I will. I apologize for that. We had one button that wasn't pushed. Yes. Yeah. Right, be back. no problem. We can we can handle this. There's all, all right. kinds of glitches sometimes. Again, our compaction goals are density, smoothness, okay. and high stability. Of course, compaction why improve mechanical stability 
improve resistance to rutting, reduce moisture penetration, improve resistance to cracking. Of course, our compaction forces are pressure, a downward force impact would be hammer blows, vibration or rapid series of impact blows, and manipulation, kneading in a confined manner. The four phases of compaction here, we went over those, but here is a screenshot of the screed. Our breakdown roller, usually a steel wheel in vibratory mode. Number three is our intermediate roller, can be a pneumatic tire roller or maybe a steel wheel. And then our finish roller. The four phases of compaction, I believe this is where we stopped just now. I think everybody is on board. We're getting some feedback saying they can all see it now, so we're in good shape. The screed is key to smooth pavements, provides initial compaction. So that's our first part. The second part's the intermediate, I'm sorry, go down, breakdown rollers, number two. The primary roll is for compaction, usually a vibratory steel wheel roller. Our third part is the intermediate roller, primary rolls to lock up the aggregate structure. It could be a pneumatic or a steel wheel. Our fourth one is the finish roller. Primary roll is smoothness to get out any marks left by the other rollers. And usually it's a static steel wheel roller. So you can see the four phases. Uh, we teach this a lot in our 1B class. Uh, this is uh, just a good rule of thumb, best practices for laying asphalt. Types of rollers. We have our steel wheel roller and we run that in vibratory or static. Uh, the vibratory just helps assist uh, locking up everything and moving it together as we compact it. Pneumatic roller, usually a rubber tired roller. Uh, some contractors don't use a pneumatic roller. Uh, just depends on how you set up your paving compaction train. Steel wheel or our breakdown roller provides a combination uh, of compaction force by a combination of weight and vibration of their steel drums. They vary in weight from seven to 17 tons. They vary in size, two to five foot drum diameters and four to eight feet drum widths. And we can also operate these in different modes, static with the vibrating off. Maybe we have a single drum vibrating or both drums vibrating at the same time. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. And there are oscillating rollers. Yeah, Darren uh, asked a question about oscillating rollers. We do have uh, different modes of, uh, of being able to utilize those type of different rollers that are out there. Yes. Steel wheel. Now we like to talk about amplitude. That's the greatest movement in one direction, either up or down, of the vibrating roller drum from a position of rest. Frequency is the number of vibrations, downward impacts per minute. Impact spacing should be between 10 to 14 impacts per foot. Direction, the eccentric weight should rotate in the same direction as the drum is rolling. That's a very important part of this. Now let's talk about amplitude. Distance the drum moves is called amplitude. The amplitude determines the impact force. The higher the amplitude, the higher the force. Of course, the lower the amplitude, the lower the force. Frequency is the number of drum impacts per minute, typically from 10 to 14 impacts per foot. The little picture kind of paints the, what we're looking at there. A vibra vibrating tachometer can be used to check the BPM, which is Vibrations per minute, you can see a picture or a screenshot, and they vary in different things, uh, different looks. But you can set this on the asphalt and let the roller come by, and you can watch the little movement of the, the meter in there, and then you can take it and go to a chart like this next slide. And we can see here if we're going three miles an hour and we have 3,200 vibrations per minute, that means we're getting 12.12 impacts per foot. So it's a helpful chart. Uh, most of the time we'd like to stay between that 2600 and 3600, which you can see as the different miles per hour. And you can see that we really don't like to go over three miles an hour with these rollers. Just a good rule of thumb, best practices. 
Pneumatic roller. Use rubber tires to compact through a kneading action, the force of manipulation. May be used in all phases of compaction, but is mostly used during the intermediate phase. And be sure you warm up the tires before compacting to avoid pickup. Chuck, those tires will pick up that mix, and then you've got a problem. Yeah, so it's, it's imperative that, uh, that the pneumatic roller is used, correctly used, with uh, um, the correct PSI and the, and the tires, you know, the, uh, the pouch experiences in the tires. No doubt that uh, it can cause more damage than good sometimes. Exactly right. Of course, the pneumatic roller, they have an overlap of tires, which manipulates the mat under and between the tires. A tight finish of the mat lowers the air voids. Now you can see this picture here, if you were looking at the front or the back, how the tires uh, are in between each other so that you get this downward and outward uh, compaction pressure at kneading effect, which helps us. Now those tires are offset from the front to back. And you can see with the proper air pressure how those lines of forces are going down into the asphalt. Right. So and again, our whole purpose here is to uh, compact the mix, to lower the air void, to be able to get the, the mix to be able to be long lasting. That's right. Of course, a pneumatic roller, they vary in weight from 10 to 35 tons. They may have three or four rubber tires in the front axle and four or five rubber tires on the back axle. You can see in the picture here, I've got two different types there. There's five on the front and four on the back on the first uh, pneumatic and then on the other one it's kind of reversed. Uh, wheels move up and down independently of each other. The weight per wheel varies from 3,000 to 3,500 pounds. So it's a good shot of how a pneumatic roller works. Of course, the tires must be inflated to equal pressure. Now, be sure you look on the sidewall of the tires and see what the rating is and the recommended tire pressure and try to keep them all the same PSI. They're usually between 60 and 120 PSI. Uh, best practices would be 70 PSI for a tender mix and 90 PSI for a stiff mix. Be sure you warm these tires up for, before compacting of the hot mat hot mix mat to make sure that the asphalt won't stick to the tires. And you'll see by the bottom picture on the left, the skirts keep the tires warm during the day, keep that wind from blowing off of them, Chuck. And proper, proper inflation and then maintaining the, the, uh, the tires uh, being warm will prevent uh, material being picked up. That's right. Again, if you have low tire pressure, that means they're not inflated properly you're gonna have low force. But if you have the high tire pressure where they're inflated properly, you're gonna have good high force downward pressure into the mat. This kneading action will again, will assist in our compaction. Finish roller, they vary in size and weight, usually three to 10 tons, about eight tons typical per unit. They have a three to five foot diameter wheels Heavier rollers may be used during the breakdown uh, phase of the compaction. The finished rollers may be used for the last phase of the compaction. Drums must be smooth and clean. Be sure you uh, make those uh, scrape plates to where they'll uh, wipe off anything that gets on those steel wheels where we don't tear up the asphalt. Vibratory rollers can run in static mode. So we can use them for a, a variety of uh, applications. So Larry, you went through uh, the, uh, the breakdown roller and the pneumatic roller as your intermediate and then a, a finishing roller, uh, you know, to help maybe uh, work out some of the, the marks from the, uh, from the pneumatic, that's, that's the finishing roller will help do that. But when you talked about the, uh, the amplitude and the frequency and the different types of roller, again, uh, the reason that Larry went through those is because of a, of a He's looking for a balanced paving plan. We're trying to get the maximum compaction of the mix with the least amount of force. Okay, that's the whole purpose here. So you can utilize uh, different types of rollers, different types of frequency, at different types of amplitude, what works best for each mix. The bottom line is, is that you have all these tools available on the rollers to be able to 
to utilize to be able to compact the mix to its optimum density using the least amount of force. We don't want to beat the material to out. We just want to beat it up uh, because then it affects the ride quality of the whole thing. So uh, amplitude and frequency of your bigger rollers, your pneumatic rollers, uh, getting the right tire pressure, kneading uh, the material correctly, and then finishing off with, this, with the finished roller, utilizing the least amount of compaction effort is what we're trying to do. And again, the very first initial breakdown is the screed. That's right. That's, that's the most important part also is the screed is your initial breakdown. So paying attention to the way that your screed set up is going to help you achieve, you know, your densities of the mat um, with the least amount of compactive effort. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to achieve here. So. Well, also, if we overroll it, then when we start checking density, it'll, it'll, it'll show us that we need more compaction and we've already gone too far. Also look for damaged aggregate, broken aggregate. That'd be another sign of overcompaction. Maybe too much force too. Compaction factors. Now we're going to talk about mixed properties, which would be aggregate, asphalt, mixed temperature. Uh, we're going to talk about layer thickness, environmental factors, and the rollers again, just uh, shortly. The aggregate structure, basically, Chuck, our asphalt is just made up of asphalt, aggregate, and air. And air, and that's it. Uh, we won't read all these things over here, but. You can see up there, coarse aggregates in there. The inag particles could be the small pieces, maybe of sand, smaller aggregate. The asphalt binder, the cement that's in there. And then the air voids. We have to have the air voids in there, but there is a range and we have to make sure we get proper density, which will get those air void ranges in the right place. The asphalt liquid is a part of the structure, uh, the common, uh, performance graded PG binders are 64 minus 22, usually not modified. The 70 minus 22 is almost always modified along with the 76 minus 22. And again, Tell us about the adding of the numbers and we know about that. Yes, yeah, so the, the rule of 90 here comes into play and that's in some of our other presentations, but anytime you add those two numbers together and you have 90 and above, then we're going to have to modify that all. And the reason that's so important uh, was because of the fact that modified oils are take different compaction efforts. So when you're dealing with modified oils, you're going to have to really look at your rolling, uh, rolling uh, procedures and your rolling train to be able to maximize your, your densities. So, uh, so we have the aggregates, which will be next. The aggregate structure is going to be next. But between the aggregate and the asphalt, uh, those different combinations are going to affect your rolling patterns. Yeah, as you go into these higher modified and asphalt blends, uh, you're going to have to change your rolling pattern and make active effort will change also. Mixed temperature. Of course, it has a major effect on, a major effect on the compaction. Uh, you want to compact the mix while the asphalt is still fluid, enough to allow aggregate movement. Once that locks up, then we are stuck, so to speak. So those rollers have to get on it as soon as they can have to watch out for the tender zone. We'll talk about the tender zone here in a minute. Mixed temperature, too hot. Let's talk about that for a minute. Look for bulges in front of the drum. You can see the picture here. The mat will move around and not compact. Rollers may leave deep marks. And again, stay back from the paper until the material cools. We call that our tender zone. Tender zone. So it's, it's real imperative that we know uh, what material that we're dealing with, if it's just a dense graded material, like a, a regular type D hot mix that we're rolling, uh, it's going to react differently than you will with a, a modified 76 minus 22 surface mix that has uh, that's at a higher temperature. So it's imperative that you know where, where the maximum uh, amount of compaction can happen at that temperature, which means you'll need temperature guns. So uh, it's determined that each material is going to react differently and you just have to pay attention and utilize the tools that are, are, that are with the roller and utilize your, your temperature gun and your nuclear density gauge to be able to, uh, to determine that, that tender zone. Next is mix, mix temperature too cool, too cold. There's no mixture movement possible. Our density results will vary. So best practices would be try to work closer to the paper. Right. Increase the force. Maybe you can adjust your uh, amplitude, 
frequency and things like this to help us out or add rollers. Chuck, I'd rather have a roller part, maybe not need it, than to need it and not be able to get it. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's imperative. Environmental effects. The air temperature. The surface temperature. I mean, the, the heat can be drawn out uh, through the uh, structure below the asphalt just as much as it can be escaping through the atmosphere. Uh, the weather conditions influence the roller types and size. And I've underlined this and put an exclamation point out beside it. Wind has a major effect on compaction. Okay, the environmental effects of compaction is imperative. I think this is one of the, the things that we don't pay attention to enough uh, out in the field, especially with the wind temperature. So there's a couple of apps that are out there on, that are available on your uh, iPhone or your Android. There's a multi cool app and also an app called the Asphalt Pro uh, that will help you determine uh, the time that, that you have between when the material comes out the back of the screen to where you can get the maximum compaction. And a lot of that with the wind, Larry has wind as a major uh, effect on compaction. Uh, you could be 85 degrees outside on a cloudy day and uh, that wind can definitely give you, cut your time down. Uh, to just several minutes before you can maximize your compaction efforts. Right. So between the material cooling, crusting over, and um, and the temperature where you're trying to stay out of the tender zone, it's imperative. Environmental effects really do have an, a, a, a huge effect on on your compaction. It's one of the it's one of the things that we don't take a look at when we're having issues out in the field when we're trying to when we're trying to achieve density. We really don't take to an effect the uh, the air surface and the wind factor. So. so uh, these tools will help you do that. So um, again, the uh, Asphalt Pro is a tool that you can download off of the uh, for uh, uh, the iPhone app. It only works on the iPhone app right now. And then uh, MultiCool is a, is an app that you can get to uh, to help with the temperatures. And there's several on the phones. You can go look up uh, for asphalt paving, and uh, some of those apps are really helpful out in the field. Environment again, uh, the hot weather, the, the mix will stay workable longer. Uh, cold weather, uh, you might have a crust that will form early and you'll get less uh, active effort. Adjust the rolling pattern as conditions change. I've been on several jobs before and said, well, we were doing just a wonderful job this morning and after lunch, we we're having some troubles and it could be you had a little cold front come in cloud cover came over, the wind speed increased. So uh, just watch for those changes and be able to, to adapt to those changes. Lift thicknesses. The thickness affects the ability to compact the mat and achieve density. Uh, we got an example here of a four to one ratio, four inch lift thickness to one inch nominal aggregate size. You can see the picture. Uh, the second bullet on the right there, table 12 and item 341, that's the text dot spec book, lists the minimum and maximum lift thicknesses. Now there's a table in each one of the specifications. So whichever specification you're under, you can go look for the table. The number may change. Table 12 and one might be table 11 and another one. But go up and look at those maximum and minimum lift thicknesses. And that general rule of thumb, that's just a general rule of thumb, you know, four to one uh, for mat thickness. Again, we're, we're not wanting to crush the aggregate. So if your aggregate size is, say, uh, half inch or three quarters inch, then, you know, you're going to have to have a three inch mat. So when you're looking at that, or a three quarter inch is going to be a three inch mat. When you're looking at that, it's, it's to prevent crushing of the aggregate and still maintain uh, your density. Sure. So it's imperative that that we take that we take this into account. Of course, thick lifts, thicker lifts are uh, more difficult to achieve uniform density from the top to the bottom. You might try a higher amplitude setting. You can see the picture here: the waves going into the asphalt, uh, more than two inches thick. So, uh, just kind of keep that two inches in the back of your head. And you'll be able to realize you don't want to get where Chuck, where they'll bridge the asphalt, the surface, and then the bottoms 
not being compacted. So look at those thicknesses. Could possibly your roller being too small. I've had that happen before. Absolutely. So be sure you keep an eye on that. The thinner lifts. Thinner lifts maybe are more difficult to achieve density. Use, uh, using rollers in the vibratory mode may crush the aggregate. Watch for that. Chuck mentioned that a while ago. You might try running in static mode, or you might try lowering the amplitude. And there's several uh, mixed types that require you not to use uh, vibratory, that, that requires you to use it in the static mode just for that nature. There's several several mixed types that, that are out there that, uh, uh, that we have to use just in the static mode. Yeah. There's several mixed types also that are out there that are currently being used that we're not allowed to use a pneumatic roller on. You just use the, the standard uh, roller with it in a static mode, and that's just to set the aggregate uh, and not cause it to, you know, to, uh, uh, to crush it. Yeah. One of them comes to mind is the permeable friction course, yeah, the PSC. PSC. You just roll it with a steel wheel roller in static mode, no pneumatics, just to set the aggregate, and you want to keep those interconnecting air voids to allow the permeability of the, the water. Right. Some of our thinner mats, like the Tom mixes, they're those all, possibly can just be done with a steel they're wheel. They're all in a steel wheel static mode. So they all have different applications. Now this is titled uh, Compaction Adequate. We're going to talk about this for a minute. Overlaps. A minimum of a six inch overlap assures uniform compaction. A roller should cover the map between two to three overlapping passes. Now Chuck, depending on how wide your roller drum is, this could change some. We don't want to take density readings. You can see where that six inch overlap is because we would be going over that area twice as much as we would the bigger area. Our density might be affected and we wouldn't get good results. So put your gauges out in these areas where the first and second pass are to get some readings and then you'll get some good results. Try to avoid those areas where the overlapping areas are. And we'll go over that here in a little bit, in a couple of minutes. Mat compaction. Always start from the bottom and work up on a slope mat. Now you can see you would be going away from you here and back towards you. I'm not talking about going up transverse across the, the lane. Start at the bottom, build some support for successive passes and work your way to the top of the road, if you will. Best practices for rollers. Never park a roller on a hot mat. Deep marks will not roll out. Never turn drums while the roller stopped. Stop the roller at a 30 to 45 degree angle and turn towards the center of the mat. When necessary, you may turn outward off the mat also. Just depends on your situation. And if you have to park the roller, park it back on a compacted mat that's uh, completed or on a shoulder. All right. So the best practices uh, for rolling, and, and we talked about this uh, a little bit uh, uh, last month, the whole aspect of this, or the whole purpose of this is to have a balanced paving plan. You know, you want to be able to balance your rollers with your paver and balance the speed of your rollers with your paver. So that determines how many rollers you're going to have, and it's going to determine how, how, how many tons per hour you're going to lay. So looking at this, the best practices for it is where Larry says always park back on a compacted mat or shoulder. The very first thing we do is have a paving plan. And uh, a lot of the times, if you can, try to pave the shoulder first. So that way you have a place for your rollers to get off on. You know, when you're watering them or when you're, when you're uh, doing any kind of uh, uh, maintenance or you're doing a switchover, try to get that, that, that shoulder paved first. So you have a place for the roller to pull off on and then pave the mat next to it. But that all goes back to when we talk about best practices is to have a paving plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute, but I just want to stress enough that, that for the best practice to even work, you have to have a plan. That's right. And, you know, during the day, you're going to have a service truck come by and fill the fuel, fill them full of water. You don't want them just to stop on the hot asphalt. No. Uh, yeah, move back to an area that's already compacted. Never roll off an unconfined edge. A collapsed edge will create a joint failure. You can see this picture here, uh, quite a debacle. Now we've got to go back and maybe cut this out to get it back correctly. Looks like a couple of places they stopped there and just really messed up this mat. Yeah. 
Of course, best practices again, uh, dry drums will pick up hot mix. So proper spray practices could be use clean water, change those filters, uh, check your spray nozzles for distribution, and only use an approved release agent. Now that release agent will help take the tension out of that water where it will disperse better across that drum. Uh, you don't want to lose uh, $10,000, $15,000 of asphalt because of a $4 filter or something. Drum reaming. Too many vibratory passes. May we compacted the effort as far as we can get it. We start getting this drum ringing or bouncing. Of course, reduce the number of passes. You might even lower the amplitude. Sometimes we get that amplitude way out of shape and we got to bring those marks back. So be sure to adjust that as you need it. Roller crawling, we're applying too much force. You can actually see the picture here where it looks like the roller's like just moving around and moving sideways on us. Lower the amplitude and adjust the frequency. Again, we've got these adjustments way out. Uh, maybe we needed to try to get better density and we start cranking them up. That's not what we need to do sometimes. Too much again, we want to compact the material with the least amount of effort. That's the whole purpose. Compact the material with the least amount of effort uh, so that you have a smooth riding surface. Uh, this roller crawling and, and ringing of the drum, those are all going to create chatter in the, in the mat. That's right. And you can have compaction. You can add your density. You can add your 94% density, but at what cost? And so utilize the different frequency uh, settings, utilize the amplitude settings, utilize the different rolling uh, patterns to be able to prevent this from happening. That's the whole, that's the whole purpose uh, of the frequency and the amplitude and the amount of rollers. Of course, again, we talk about the tires cooling down or cold tires will pick up hot mix. Here's a good picture we took of a pneumatic roller where the mix was sticking to it. Uh, you can see maybe that the scraper pads are not adjusted properly. It could be that the water wasn't spraying on the, the tires like they needed. The tires got cold. And again, there's, there's no way to fix this. Once, once asphalt starts picking up, whether it's on your steel wheel or on your pneumatic, once that happens, there's no way to fix it. You just can't come back and throw a, a, a shovel full of fines in there and try to rake it. It's, 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 it's mass detriment. And so uh, it's imperative that we're paying attention. And as soon as we see any kind of uh, material pickup that we pull off the mat, get off the mat, and uh, either we're on it too hot with the uh, pneumatic or we're not utilizing the release agent correctly. That's right, and there may be several ways of heating those tires up. Maybe we just run the roller up and down the road a little bit uh, to get those tires warmed up. We can put the skirts on there. We use a release agent on those tires. Uh, maybe we run a little bit on the asphalt back and forth to get those tires heated up. But they've got to be hot. Here's a picture, keep the tires hot, use an approved release agent, apply to clean tires before rolling, and be safe while applying this. You can see this picture. We would not want the guy operating the roller to be backing up. If the guy holding the sprayer happened to trip and fall, then uh, the, the guy on the roller may not see him and roll right over. So yeah. walk with the roller and never back up on somebody. We we'll always want to practice safety. And never apply release agent to your pneumatics or anywhere else, you know, unless the, the roller is moving. You right. just don't want to sit there and spray spray down. And I've seen many times on, on the roadways, and you see them, the pneumatic marks that are left, they look like they're, they're scuffing marks where That's they're right. actually, where they're spraying the release agent, they're using too much of it, too much too and, it and it actually is stripping the asphalt is what it's doing. That's right. So when you're driving through uh, these different projects and you see these pneumatic roller marks, uh, pulled out is because they're they're over utilizing the release agent and not keeping their tires hot. If you keep your tires hot uh, while you're using the pneumatic roller, it shouldn't pick up. Right. Of course, uh, the use of the tire skirts again will help keep the tires hot. Here's a very good picture of the skirts uh, from the factory installed on the roller. The use of a squared profile tires help eliminate tire markings and cupping from the rounded bias plot tires. Now, they don't have any tread on them. What we mean is that surface of that tire is flat and not rounded. 
And that's 99% of them we see are that way. Right. Roller speed, slow and steady. The slower speed will get more compactive efforts. It's better to add rollers than to speed up rollers to catch the paver. Now we're gonna talk about speed here in a minute, but three mile an hour is a good rule of thumb chuck for steel wheel. Right, so we talked earlier, I talked earlier about having a balanced paving plan. Uh, the roller, and this was talked about during our, our, our meeting last week, the roller really is gonna dictate your paving speed. The, the amount of rollers and how fast you're rolling really dictates your paving speed, and slow and steady is better. So it doesn't do you any good to pave 200 tons an hour if your rollers are not keeping up uh, uh, with that paving speed. So uh, your rollers will dictate your paving speed, and like Larry said, three miles an hour or so, that's about the, as fast as a, a, you know, a brisk walk right. type of deal. And again, it's better to, to add rollers or have one available to add if we're having issues with density. And usually when I go out to check some areas, sometimes that's the issue is the rollers are just going too fast. Here's a little speed chart, a double drum vibratory roller, two to four miles an hour. A pneumatic roller, two to three miles an hour. Static steel roller, uh, wheel rollers, three to five miles an hour. So you can kind of see that area in there with the chart here. Rolling patterns. Let's talk about this for a minute. We're going to get into the text dot uh, test procedure on this. Uniform compaction depends on getting the same number of roller passes over each area of the mat. A pattern must be developed that covers the entire mat with an equal number of roller passes from each type of roller. For setting rolling patterns, we want to ensure that the uh, effective compaction of the mat to achieve specified density requirements, and also to select the optimum combination of rollers and the number of passes for each type of roller. Now, 207F, part four, the control strip method is right there in the TxDOT uh, testing procedures. You can look that up and read more about it, it's only two or three pages. We took some of the highlights out of that test procedure and put them in here for us to talk about for a few minutes. It says to get you establish a control strip, which is 300 foot long and 12 foot wide, or the width of the paver that you're paving. Now 300 foot we know is a football field length, goal to goal, so it's quite a big area. It says allow the roller to complete two coverages of the entire control strip. And you can see here by a diagram, you have pass one, back would be pass two, then you'd move over to get pass three, pass four would be back, and then five would take you back to your start. So a five pass pattern, that provides one complete coverage. This is before we ever to check density. Now I'm just going by the test procedure that TxDOT's established. Then it says to select three test sites and perform a density test reading on each side. Now you're just gonna check pounds per cubic feet. So you can see our little picture here. We're gonna check one here possibly and maybe go up to the middle, check another area. And then we're gonna maybe go across. This is just a way that we've established where you can kind of go all the way across, checking the area, maybe from one end to the other. And you can do more than this if you wish. Be sure you mark your areas. Be sure you put your gauge back in the same position and run it properly. Then it says repeat the process until there is no significant increase in density. Now on thinner mats, Chuck, we'd have to reduce the number of roll passes. Right. On thicker mats, you might have to increase them. That's what the rolling pattern control strip method is all about, is a systematic way to establish rolling patterns. Now you can, you can vary from this depending on your mat thickness, the number and size of rollers you have, 
Material types. Yep. Material types and all this. This is just a starting process in a test procedure form. Adjust the rolling pattern when conditions change, like base, wind, temperatures. Uh, we've been kind of talking about all different types. Your environment changes. If it becomes all of a sudden exactly. it starts getting cloudy on you. Uh, I see where everybody everybody's having a a fine time, and we're getting great compaction efforts, and we're and we're and we're rolling along, and all of a sudden our density's falling off. Right. And most of the time, you just need to pay attention to your environmental, whether it became cloudy, the wind picked up, or that you had a, a change in your material is also another cause for it. But uh, a lot of times, if the plant's running correctly and everything's going fine, it's typically going to be your environment. That's right. You know, and those roller operators have to to be able to uh, see these changes. And make adjustments with your to QC them. Guy, your yeah, QC with the QC guy. guys running along checking these things, they need to work together very much. So we can have the best asphalt in the world, and the last guy in the roller paving train can mess it all up. And we're good. We're going to open it up for questions now. Yeah. So the, the presentation is going to be downloaded uh, to our website where you can get it all free. Uh, Corey. Schwartz is in charge of, uh, of getting us uh, uh, putting it out there on our website. So we'll have that probably up in the next couple of days or so. So you can get this one. And you can also get the last one that we that we did about um, uh, prepaid meetings. And then also. We have a question up here. It says, uh, the roller leaves marks as it gets back on the hot mix after filling with water. How can the marking be reduced? Yeah, so that's imperative, and that's what we talked about having a plan. So we talked to them before you even start paving. Before you even start paving, we're going to discuss how we're going to move this roller when we need water in the roller or when we need uh, fuel in it. Where are we going to get at? We need to pull either completely to a section of mass that's already been completed, right, or we need to pull it off to the shoulder that's already been paved, but we definitely do not need to be on a hot mat where it leaves a mark. Um, it's just it's imperative that you have a plan. So when that happens, when the when a roller's sitting there getting filled full of water and leaving a mark, if we didn't have a plan, and that that's my whole that's my whole take is that you got to have a plan of where that roller's going to be filled at, who's going to be in charge of it, and then also when you're stopping, if you would pull to a 45 degree angle like we talked about, you have less of a chance for having a roller mark. Now if you do have a roller mark like this. Uh, a lot of times that finishing, if it's still if it's still hot enough to leave a roller mark like that, uh, the finishing roller can get in there and work it out. But again, uh, that compactive effort, uh, that force of effort that we're utilizing has a tendency to crush aggregate. It has a tendency to, to give you a bad ride, to give you that chattered ride that we're, we're wanting to stay away from. So um, it's imperative, again, that we, that we have a plan, uh, where we're going to water at, how often we're going to water, where that roller is going to be and how it's going to be uh, uh, situated on the mat or on a paved shoulder on a shoulder that's sort of been paved. Now we have unmuted everyone. Does anybody have a question? Here's another question somebody's typed in. How to minimize mix discoloration at transverse joints from the last section rolled today versus the first section rolled tomorrow? Yes, yeah, that, and that's, that's one of my pet peeves. Trans, transverse joints are my pet peeves. So we saw a cut back, and that's where, that's where we got to do. We need to come back three to four, five feet from the last day's joint and saw cut and remove that. Saw cut that back and remove that. Have the paving train, again, this goes about having a plan, but have the paving train only move forward for that, you know, 25 or 30 feet in front and be able to slow down or stop so that you can get that transverse joint correct. Uh, typically, when we have that discoloration point or we have that, it's where we're fighting to get that transverse joint correct in terms of fighting it to get it correct uh, height to where we don't have a bump. And it just comes with experience and it comes with time. But I can't stress enough that if you saw cut back three to four or five feet away from the day's end and remove that material, you have a better chance at hitting that than you would uh, if you just come over there and just try to saw cut one or two inches away from it like I've seen in the past. Do we have any more questions? You know, Darren Duncan asked, he was on the line earlier and he asked about oscillating rollers. 
there is oscillating rollers that are out there. Uh, they've worked well. Uh, we elected just to talk about the, the, the standard vibrating and pneumatic rollers, mainly because oscillating rolling, not everybody has them. Uh, they're, they're uh, I don't want to say new, but uh, typically for asphalt production placement, um, you know, we're utilizing just the standard vibrating and pneumatic rollers. But the oscillating rollers have, have been very successfully used. Uh, we just elected because most companies and most uh, cities and counties utilize just the standard vibrating rollers and the standard uh, pneumatic rollers. Right. That's a good question, Darren. All right, we have another question. Uh, an inch and a half uh, thick mat was rolled. Oh, yep. let me see, we've lost our... Ripple effect. It says it was rolled, met density, but the next day after driving on the mat, some areas had a ripple effect. Right. Yeah, and that ripple, and that ripple effect typically comes from um, messing with trying to get compaction. And on an inch and a half mat, we just went through four times nominal size aggregate. So when we're talking with an inch and a half mat, think about how small that aggregate size is. We in Texas have a tendency to lay our dense graded mixes, our type D dense graded mixes, too thin. So an inch and a half mat is, uh, you know, you got, you got three eighths inch rock and less in it. In other words, it's harder to get density on it. So me personally, I would prefer a dense graded material, a type D that we all use every day for the cities and the counties and the state. We all use it. I'd like to see that at a two inch mat. If we're going to try to utilize and get density and be able to have that, that mat perform for seven, eight, 10, 12 years, a two inch mat would be the minimum I would lay on. That ripple effect comes from trying to, you know, manipulate that, that mat uh, to get densities with. Right. Great question. Appreciate it. All right. Here's another question somebody just typed in. Uh, I sometimes see low compaction on overlays. Does the condition of the existing mat being overlaid cause loss of compaction? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Asphalt's only as good as what you lay it on. So if that underlying structure is, is, has been compromised uh, or has not been taken care of or we haven't uh, uh, completely looked at the full depth uh, repairs on it or if that existing structure we're just overlaying it has wheel ruts in it. Uh, you know, you're going to have a different compaction force. If you have wheel ruts where you have high spots and a low spot, you're going to have a different compaction force in the wheel rut as then on the high spot. Uh, you won't have uniform compaction through it. So it definitely causes loss of compaction. It's imperative that we, we look at the existing structure, we fix the existing structure to be able to, to uh, put the overlay on top of it, and then, and again, inch and a half um, overlay. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm looking at min a minimum of two inches instead of an inch and a half uh, to be able to get you know, the correct compaction effort all the way across. Great question. Anything else? Any more questions? Okay. There's no more questions. Um, we appreciate everybody being here. Again, uh, we're going to try to hold these uh, monthly, these monthly uh, webinars like this. I believe our next one's going to be on milling practices, the best practices for uh, for being able to do uh, uh, optic milling. So really appreciate everybody being here. And again, this will be on our website here in the next couple of days. Just go to our website, texasatfault.org, and you can get this or the other uh, two or three that we've done previously. That's right. So right. We want to thank everybody for attending this morning. Again, utilize our website for these webinars and uh, tell your friends about them and we're going to be doing one a month and possibly after the first year we might be doing two a month we appreciate everybody's attendance and this will conclude our webinar for today thank you